Welcome to a Techler interview where I interview a prominent person in the privacy and security community to give you all fresh insights. Today, I'm going to have Rob Shavel on, the CEO of Abines Delete Me, which is a service you may know as an automatic deletion service for your profiles on people searching websites. We'll define what that even is today. Rob is a vocal proponent of privacy legislation reform, including the California Privacy Rights Act. And in today's interview, we're going to chat about what even exactly is what we call a people searching website, why they're even the problem in the first place, how they're different from a phone book back in the day, what the scope of the problem is, where the extensive data comes from, and what you can do about it, as well as a lot more. I know before going into this, a lot of people seem confused on how data brokers are able to gather so much extensive data about themselves and successfully correlate it between different areas. And this is actually Rob's expertise, which he dives into very thoroughly. So without further ado, enjoy this interview with Rob. Let's start with just basic terminology here for ourselves and for our audience to kind of establish a baseline. Uh, what exactly, because I refer to them as people searching websites, what exactly is a people searching website? What um, classifies it as a people searching website? Let's just kind of start there. I'm a, a student of semantics and, and I think uh, there's lots of names for lots of things and it creates lots of confusion, especially in the tech world as we know. Uh, I would actually start with the concept of Googling uh, yourself or another person. And the results that come back when you Google yourself, if you have ever tried it, if you haven't, I recommend you do, uh, or another person uh, tend to be varied. Of course, some of us are uh, more famous than others. Some of us have gone to different schools than others and results vary. But one of the categories, the top categories of results are something that you're referring to, which are called people searching or people search uh, uh, websites or data brokers. And those sites advertise and have uh, search engine optimization uh, for finding details about people's personal information. And that's what we're talking about here. And is there a way... I, I figure there's no like formal classification. It's not like there's a restaurant <laughs> that you can go like that's a restaurant. It falls under the bucket of being a food business. We can classify this as a restaurant versus a grocery store. Is well, there I mean, any site that there's different there's different classifications. And, you know, I think most people know it when they see it. But I mean, I'll give you some examples. There's if you go to whitepages.com and type in a name. Uh, or if you go to Google and type in a name, you'll often see whitepages.com come up and there'll be a result that says, hey, we think we have information about that name and we have some uh, salacious details, maybe uh, their cell phone number and maybe their current address and maybe their arrest record if they have one. And and then you can go to whitepages.com and type the same thing in and follow uh, the results down to the person, uh, whether it's yourself or somebody else that you're looking for. So that would be an example. It's kind of like, uh, and I like to use wait pages because some of us are old enough to remember the phone book. Not all of us. Uh, it's sort of like the phone book ported onto the internet. And then you have uh, business versions of that where uh, companies like Zoom Info and others where you can find out more about where somebody works and their work number and their their position and maybe their salary information. So it goes on and on and on. But ultimately we're talking about the public exposure of personal information uh, that is easy for others to find that we may not be super comfortable with anyone being able to purchase or find. Got it, that makes a lot of sense. Now, before we cover, I guess, where this data is sourced from and how it even ends up there in the first place. Why do these exist in the first place? And this might seem like a basic question, but why do these sites exist in the first place? Is there a valid, because there has to be, I have to assume that there should be a valid use case for these sites existing in the first place um, or else they wouldn't be there. Or is this completely an invasion of privacy and this should just not exist in the first place? I know that's kind of a tough question to ask, but I, I think it's worth asking. It is. It's a simple question, but there are many different ways to answer it and many different viewpoints. Uh, but I think it's an important question. One way to answer it is we want information about other people. 
Uh, we're social animals, after all, uh, as uh, Mark Zuckerberg would point out. Uh, and it turns out that upwards of 10% uh, of queries typed into Google are about people. And so that is, you know, billions and billions of queries per hour or whatever, uh, you know, Google's at these days. It's, it's an insane number. And when you sit back and reflect on it, it's a very powerful statistic. It, it means that we're constantly looking for information about, uh, about other human beings. Maybe we uh, are doing some research. Maybe we met somebody. Maybe we're, uh, you know, on the, on the less uh, uh, ethical side of things, uh, stalking somebody, or we have a, you know, a, a, a grudge uh, to, to bear. But at any rate, whatever the uh, motivation is, there's a lot of people looking for information on others. And so that's one reason, you know, it's a capitalist economy. One reason these uh, people search sites exist is because there's a lot of demand for it. And so um, playing devil's advocate here, if someone goes, well, you know, back in my day, we used to have white pages and it was no big deal. They've just digitized it and moved it to the internet. Is there a difference between white pages today and white pages back in the day where you just look up someone's phone number? Great question. One of my favorites and uh, a really important one because especially for those uh, listeners that uh, maybe didn't use phone books because uh, they were lucky enough to be born. I've uh, never used a phone book for the record. Great. So <laughs> great. You're, you're exactly who I'm talking about. The way that the phone book worked is where you, you know, where, wherever you lived, uh, the phone company would drop off a big book every year with uh, everybody's numbers that wanted to be listed. And that was most people because you couldn't get calls if, uh, you know, there was value to you. You couldn't get phone calls to your home if you weren't listed and, and, and so on. So almost everybody was in the phone book and you could look them up by, by name. By the way, that was the only way you could look somebody up. First name, last name. One phone number, home phone number, uh, and that was it. And it was local to your city or your area. And it was provided by your local phone company. And so... It was a limited in scope from a privacy standpoint. You couldn't just go look anybody up. Uh, and B, uh, there wasn't a bunch of information associated with it, like um, your age, your date of birth, uh, your family members' names, uh, you know, the company you work at. It was just your number. So it, it provided layers of uh, identity and privacy uh, obfuscation or uh, protection naturally. Uh, and the internet removed all those. And not only did it remove all those, it started to suck up all of this other correlated information that we never assumed uh, would get aggregated. We never explicitly said, hey, I, I want this. It's valuable. Please create a profile of me. Uh, people search site that I've never done business with, please make it as detailed as possible and add lots of things like my cell phone number and my family's, uh, you know, and relatives uh, names and, and ages, because that would make me feel really comfortable that anybody could buy that. Uh, we never did that, but they went ahead and did it anyway, because we have had very little regulation. And it's been kind of the wild west out there. When you were talking about the phone book, I was thinking to myself, what if they um, remade the first Terminator, but Terminator had access to digital <laughs> white pages instead of having to go through the three people in the phone book to find a uh, Sarah. That. Sarah? <laughs> um, I don't know where my mind went there, but that's really good stuff. I'm sure they're going to make a, a remake of the Terminator with Chad GPT and then, uh, <laughs> you know, and then we're all in trouble. <laughs> no, that's definitely um, good. But I'm really glad you touched on that because um, that's not really a connection I've made before. The difference between, well, back then you could just look someone up by phone number. But um, I really like the difference now between a digital world. And I guess that definitely adds perspective on people who might think, well, it's the same thing just on the Internet now, which I think is well, probably. It's really, it, it, Go ahead. To just stand on it, it's really important that we that we think about that because People argue all the time, the data brokers and the people search sites argue all the time that it's no different. Hey, we're just, we're just, there's a, there's a legal concept called public record. 
And that legal concept originates hundreds of years ago, actually in the in, in Britain, uh, based on taxation and other things that you needed to provide certain information to the government. The gov- it, and it was it was and should be legally accessible to everyone. You need to have a home. You need to pay your taxes. It it has its roots there, right? You know, wait. Not only bef- was this legal uh, precedent for public records set up, you know, many, you know, many years ago, it was set up before not just the Internet, uh, but it was set up before even potentially, I have to check my dates, but potentially even before electricity was invented. So this is a very old notion. And when we take a very old set of laws and concepts and we... Um, fire them into the internet age at, at, at super uh, high fiber optic speeds, uh, it isn't all the same and it, it isn't all equivalent. And a good example uh, is not just the people search sites in, in general and all the information they collect, but like one of the pieces that they use for a lot of advertising, which is arrest records and court records. Now, it used to be that you, you had access, certain court records are public. They, anyone that's been on trial somewhere, uh, there's a record of that trial and anybody else can go see it, right? That's, it, it, it's a legal concept that we have in the United States, public record. However, it was kind of hard to go get that. If you wanted that information about somebody, you had to go to the courthouse. You had to go down to some room, uh, wait, in a line, convince some file clerk there to go back and give you a box, sift through the box, that kind of thing. Uh, So there was a lot of friction and that friction made it, uh, that friction was important because it, it, you had to want to get information about somebody uh, and, and their court uh, proceedings in a way that you couldn't just sit back on Google and say, hey, uh, you know, I want to go find this out. And the core of, of, I think, an important argument that needs to be had with regulators and, and this industry of people search sites and data brokers and privacy companies like uh, the one I am involved in is figuring out what is fair when it's ported to the internet and what's not. What what should be legal uh, when it's put on the internet and what should only be legal in an age prior to the internet making everything so easy and so accessible. And that's an important conversation to have. I don't, we don't have the time to get into that more, but but I, I bring it up because it's, it's, it's something that uh, requires more conversation. Yeah, and then I think the the really unfortunate part is uh, I'm sure that you would agree that normally uh, government is very slow to respond to technology, and so we're probably only going to see real things done about this maybe decades from now. Um, and even then, by then, technology will probably be further out ahead, and so it's kind of this perpetual game, which is going to be definitely a weird thing to experience. Um I wanted to ask, so before we start pivoting over into more of like the, the end user side of things, so people who are listening and they can get more, more information about their data and things like that, I did want to quickly ask before we move into there, where does this data tend to come from? You know, um, and I guess I'll also kind of bring this back also to the, to the phone book analogy. So the phone book analogy back in the day did people have to optionally give their phone number to the cell companies or did cell companies just automatically publish that? And then what does that look like today? Um, So what are the differences between back then and now? And nowadays, is it just a phone number? Is it an address? Is it first and last name? Is it court records? Um, And how is that all collected? I know that's a very big question, but if we can try to like just give people a breakdown of what that looks like nowadays. Yeah, a lot of a lot of questions there. I think the just to go back to the old days, uh, I believe, and I'm not a hundred percent certain uh, about this. It was opt out for the phone book rather than opt in. So uh, you had a number when you signed up for a phone number with your yeah. Obviously, you didn't have to have a phone in your house, but if you wanted one. You sign up with your local phone company and you got a number and that automatically put you in the phone book unless you said, 
No, I don't want to be in the phone book. In which case you were uh, considered to be quite a privacy advocate because you literally are unreachable. Why would you even sign up for a, a phone in your house at that point anyway? A very different era, okay? Uh, and, and I'm dating myself, but that's how it worked. Now, the question you're asking, uh, the, the second part of the question you're asking is, how does it work today? How do these people search companies assemble these dossiers and profiles about us and our families and our personal and private information? Where does it come from? And uh, nobody has a perfectly clear answer to that because the people search companies don't want you to know uh, is, is, is one, one reason. The other reason is it comes from a, a wide variety of places. I'll give you some examples. Uh, it comes from scraping, uh, Facebook profiles, uh, and, and social media profiles and Twitter and LinkedIn. So there's some amount of it that just comes from information that we're putting out there, uh, in, in the public, in the public eye that they can correlate back to an identity that record that they have. Uh, some of it also comes from government, uh, databases, uh, in, in some states, the DMV was selling, for, for, for heaven's sake, was selling uh, the data when we got a license to some of the data brokers. It comes from credit bureaus. Our good friends at Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, uh, who we all love and who have never lost anybody's information in a data breach last time I checked on being facetious on purpose. It also comes from more nefarious places that we might not realize. For example, we're excited to download a new app on our phone. We click through all of the terms of service and say yes to the privacy policy, which if we had read it carefully, like nobody does, says your information may be shared with third parties, our trusted third parties, some crap like that. And one of their trusted third parties turns out to be the people search data brokers who are buying it from them. So it comes from all those places. What's more important in my mind and what's what we've seen as a trend over the last five years is that not that this information has been out there and that we're creating it and we're perpetuating the problem, which we are, uh, but that's not the most interesting insight. The most interesting thing is the data brokers and the people search sites technology platforms have gotten much, much more sophisticated about correlating all of this data back to a correct identity. And that's when things have got get dangerous and, and accelerate because the details that they're able to uh, scrape or buy get correlated correctly into uh, a, an ever more uh, uh, detailed and particular and personal uh, file about us that they are selling online for as little as a dollar. Yeah, that's um, a lot of good insight. And I'm sure some people listening are going to be like, oh, my God. Um, so I was actually going to ask about the correlation, because the first thing you talked about was the social media profiles. And um, my first question would be, well, what about someone's social media profile would be correlated to their sold profile? Is it the fact they use their first and last name? In that case, someone would just change a first and last name. Is it the fact they're using the same email? Is it the fact they're using the same phone number? I guess theoretically, if someone was using the same password and both passwords were breached across services, they could try to correlate like uh, breached passwords that are published online. So I guess there's a ton of correlations there. Are there any particular ones? Don't, that... don't give... Don't give their CTOs too many ideas. Uh, <laughs> I, I I think it's a lot of a, a lot of different tactics, like ones that you just mentioned, as well as many others. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we're producing ever more data digitally as we go through our lives, and that's just a fact of life. And a lot of that is tied to unique identifiers uh, from our phones to our IP address uh, from our computers that are fingerprinted with different things. So it's not as simple as just, uh, you know, email uh, and, and, and other things. But uh, look, it's they're getting better at it. Uh, we're giving off more clues to these technology engines, which are looking for correlations and being able to tie together information about us 
wherever it exists, what it, you know, in whatever application we're using. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's important for people to try not to reveal some of those key identifiers, email being probably the easiest one. Uh, you know, if we're creating a profile that we know is uh, of us, that we know is we're going to use in social media or some very public facing manner. Uh, try not to use the same email that you use uh, for other, uh, you know, for other applications or areas, because that will make it harder for them to do the easiest and most dumb correlation between um, information that they have already about us and information that we're producing in a completely different realm that we might not want uh, attached to uh, you know, our, our personal identity. Yeah. Very spooky stuff. And I am scared to one day maybe read into leaks of how some of this is done and it ends up being a lot more extensive than people ever imagined. Um, or maybe it is just emails, but from what the sounds of what you're communicating, it sounds like it's a lot more in depth than that. Well, I, I, I'm generally not uh, a fear monger, but I do think it's more extensive, uh, than, than simple emails. And I think AI, uh, to, to bring up, you know, the most popular buzzword of uh, uh, 2023 so far is making that ever more uh, easy uh, because the pattern matching that uh, these large language model uh, AI engines are able to do uh, may soon uh, dwarf any of these kind of techniques that we've been talking about in terms of being able to figure out what we're doing, uh, what what really has been created by us and our identity that's out there on the web versus somebody else. So if someone is listening to this and they are curious, they're like, oh, wow, am I on one of these websites? Um, how do you suggest people look into their profiles to see what's out there? And I also wanted to ask on this note, because we have a global audience, is this a global problem and is it equally applicable to all people in all countries? I'll take the first part of the question first. Uh, Google yourself, look at the results and follow those to a couple of these people search sites and data brokers that are advertising profiles about you. You will find them almost all, uh, if you're listening to this, almost all of you will find those. Uh, and I'm Unfortunately, they're they're usually among the top results for most of us, and and so that's the way you can go see the kind of information they have on you. And if you're really curious, you can sign up for a cheap subscription and see all the details that they have. And I think most of our uh, most regular uh, everyday uh, people just not thinking about this issue will be relatively shocked at the level of detail that is out there about us. Sometimes there's a mistake uh, or two, uh, but oftentimes uh, there's things that you'd never assume because you've never given this information out to these people. You'd never assume that they have. And then it can include you know, the, the, the VIN number and make of our cars, uh, pets names, uh, like I've mentioned already, family members and relatives and their ages and dates of birth. I mean, just things that we would, most of us would consider to be highly personal and that, you know, it's not fair that, you know, companies that didn't ask us our permission are A, getting in the first place and B, selling uh, without our consent, you know, to others. I mean, it seems kind of unfair and crazy, but yet here we are. Uh, the second answer, the second part of your question is, how relevant is this internationally? I live in Canada. I live in France. I live in uh, Australia. I live in Singapore. Uh, and the answer is less, it's less prevalent than in America. In other words, we have the worst problem with people search sites and data brokers, but it is broadly happening everywhere. And that's why we uh, have uh, an international division and we have now have produced privacy reports and have customers in 25 different countries. So we see very broadly across the world uh, that 
that people search and data broker uh, activity is is unfortunately alive and well. Very cool. And I'd love to ask about that when we talk more about your service down the line. Um, before we get there, though, when you were talking about the first thing, it reminds me, so we interviewed Abine Delete Me, which is your, your deletion service that you provide for this um, a couple years ago. And we had the idea when we were producing that video, we don't normally we should step out of our comfort zone more often, but we had the idea of actually going to some of our friends locally. And I don't, I'm sure you watched the video, but we pretty much were like, okay, just give me your first and last name. And we're gonna like dig into you and like on camera, tell you what we can find out just from your first and last name. And those reactions were all real. The people were like, like what? Like, um, and some of the things that we cut out that didn't end up making it into the final thing was um, one of the people that we interviewed in that, um, in in that video we mentioned some family members and they're like oh that's like a you know that was like a person that was part of my life like the first five years of my life and they haven't been around ever since then like they are like out of my life like I don't want to think about them I don't want to hear their name anymore and so like it was kind of like an awkward moment for us when we were like oh shoot like sorry <laughs> like that's just like public information we were able to get just from a search engine and so um, we linked them everything afterwards to let them know like where we got the information from to verify that they can look at it themselves. But these were, this was information that like no friends of theirs even knew or anything like that. And so for us to dig into it just casually in a video within a few minutes of just getting their first and last name was definitely an interesting experience. And I think if more people had that reaction to it, like you said, um, it'd be a pretty shocking because most people don't even think that this is out there. Yeah, I think yeah the, the reaction that these particular friends had is is a really interesting one because it, it goes to the heart of of i think what we consider privacy it's like we reveal certain information to certain people when we're comfortable doing it and if 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 there's some family member of ours that's estranged or that we never want to talk about or you know who knows could have been abusive or you know the, the, there's an infinite variety of reasons why uh we we move on from things and and you know families change and relationships change and and to have to have that information available in public to anyone uh is is i think it's an emotional issue it goes beyond just hey uh you know do I want that or not? Am I comfortable with it or not? It becomes it becomes like a psychological and emotional issue, and and you know that's where some of this stuff uh, really uh, starts to feel not just you know unfair but downright wrong. Yeah, seeing it it like firsthand was definitely like a, a very weird experience of like oh wow, because like we're used to talking about data and you know, oh yeah they got your your email they got your phone number this is going to impact your privacy X Y Z very logical approach to it but actually seeing someone in real life like being told information that they've like clearly tried to like dispose of completely was definitely a, like something i haven't experienced before so definitely that emotional side of things that and, isn't and, really and it's not about. it's not a corner case millions of people feel this millions of people are in situations that we're not in and we don't know what their situations are and we don't know how the personal information that's uh associated with them impacts those situations but let me tell you it's millions and millions of people and uh we're doing uh we're doing those people a disservice and we're causing harm because we don't have the appropriate privacy controls legally in place uh that people can take back uh some uh, ownership around uh you know, their lives. It's, it's, it's out of control. Yeah. And I really want to talk about like rules and regulations later on. In the meantime, for individuals who are in this position that you're referring to, or really anyone who just wants to take a little bit more initiative on this problem. What I've gathered from this is the three main options people have is prevention, which is probably the best thing you can do. Once it's out there, there's manual removal, and then there's automatic removal is that would you consider that a, a good breakdown is there something i'm missing there no that's a great way to say it um so of those three do you have any insight into the pros and cons of each method um before we talk about like different options with each one of those three things sure so i mean preventative techniques you know we already talked about some of them like not using your your real 
email or the same email on some of these public services, you know, can help with prevention. Uh, we offer some tools at, 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 at Delete Me at, that help you mask or create new emails, for example, and new identity and things like that. So that's, you know, p- part of what you can do with prevent- preventative tools is to stop giving out uh, the same credentials that can be used, whether it's email or your phone or uh, credit card or, you know, other, uh, uh, you know, your, your, your phone ID, uh, stop giving those out. Uh, we'll, we'll stop the data from leaking out and being correlated in the first place. So it can be, can be highly effective, but for most of us, it's difficult slash impossible to do that in every situation all the time. Uh, so you, you know, what I recommend for most people living a normal digital life is do a few of those things where it's important and get on with your life because, uh, you know, your number one reason for, uh, living life is not, um, to restrict the information you're putting on the web. So that would be my, (laughs) (laughs) well, I mean, and look, we love, look, we love, uh, people, advocates for privacy and customers, uh, many, many of ours that are, that are high impact uh, privacy uh, people that, that want and believe that they can, uh, you know, they can take extreme uh, actions to protect themselves. And that's great. I just don't think it's, it, you know, it, it's possible for the everyday person that has to get up, grab coffee in the morning, get their kids to school and go to work to apply that kind of level of energy and sophistication uh, to for around prevention. So let's move to the move to the second one, which is uh, you know, services that oh uh, do do it yourself uh, kind of techniques to remove information that's already out there about you. Uh, that can also be effective. Uh, you know, us and, and and many others have uh, guides to help you do that. And you can go. Uh, some uh, some people search sites are are set up uh, to be easier uh, to go remove yourself from, and some are uh, purposely more difficult. But uh, they they range, and and you can spend a- anywhere from you know sixty seconds, and you can be out of somebody's database or opted out uh, to uh, you know to to potentially many times uh, you know many frustrating. Uh, attempts to go through a process where you have to verify this and then uh, respond to that and then click an SMS code that may or may not come. And we're all familiar with this kind of stuff. So there's there's various levels, but you can, I mean, the good news is you can go clean up a bunch of your digital footprint information, particularly on these uh, people search sites yourself. And it doesn't cost, doesn't cost you anything uh, other than, than time. Uh, and then uh, so it's a it's a very good option for 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 many, uh, and it also gives you an appreciation for what's out there about you, how these uh, people search uh, data broker sites market, and uh, you know th- that that sort of thing. Uh, and the third uh, category that you mentioned is sort of automated or f- services that do this stuff for you, so you don't have to do it. That's uh, you know companies like ours, Delete Me and others. Uh, and, you know, for, for those that want this issue uh, and, and the cleanup of some of their digital footprint that's easily discoverable in public that contains all this exposed uh, pers- personally identifiable information, for those people that don't have the time, uh, that, that's a great option too. Uh, the, the downside of it is, you know, it ain't cheap. We charge one hundred twenty nine dollars a year uh, per person, per individual, and we have a family plan that you know brings it down a little bit and that kind of thing. But uh, it's not inexpensive. Got it. And so, in that first bucket, preventative measures. So you also mentioned that you have something there. Yeah, we have uh, a set of tools that people can use, uh, which we call uh, masking tools, which, which which was a term we coined before the pandemic, uh, <laughs> which which was which are meant to give you the ability to not give out your real email, not give out your real phone number, not give out your real credit card to companies that you think might be sharing those details in their terms of service with 
data brokers, people search sites, and others. And by doing that, you don't have to be the same easily correlatable person everywhere you sign up for, everywhere you shop at. Uh, you can maintain a compartmentalized uh, sort of identity or set of identifiers, which can be very helpful in prevention. There are other techniques. Uh, as well, of course. I actually haven't used that specific service of yours. Um, from what I've gathered, though, so um, for listeners of ours, so you have email aliasing, phone number aliasing, and payment aliasing, which there are alternatives to all of those individually, but it sounds like what you're offering is all three of those under the same hood. So you sign up for a service and you have all three of them in one place? Correct. And uh, even better, uh, very recent news is it's now all included in uh, your Delete Me subscription. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, it wasn't up until uh, uh, very, very recently. So now all of our Delete Me customers have access to all of those uh, a aliasing or masking features that you mentioned. So you can create new email addresses that you can use, new phone numbers that you can use that can, and all these things are working. They can forward uh, emails and calls to your private, you know, email of choice or your private cell phone or whatever, and uh, virtual credit cards or alias credit cards that are actual working uh, Visa cards or MasterCards, but uh, don't have your your sixty digit number on them. Very cool. I didn't know that they were tied. Now that's really awesome um, because I personally use the, some of those individual tools myself. Um, but I still always had the delete me subscription. And so now I can probably just go ahead and test that out and see how I like it. Um, with delete me, um, that is your automatic approach to dealing with these people searching websites, correct? That's correct. It's a service that you sign up for. Then we go out and, uh, our privacy advisors, uh, and our, uh, technology platform combined go out and search. Uh, on your behalf for all your personal information and uh, wherever we find it at these uh, people search sites, we tell you, and we don't just tell you that we found it, we tell you exactly what we found where, uh, and you get a report on that. And we tell you that we've begun the process of opting you out of each of those. And over time, and that time can range from hours to uh, uh, many, many weeks, uh, they, uh, start removing that information based on our requests and the various processes that we have to navigate to do that. And the way delete me as a service and many of our competitors as well, uh, are architected is we do it on a regular basis. So information can be repopulated into these data brokers. Over time, we create new information, we sign up for some other thing or app, and all of a sudden they get our uh, phone number back and we're receiving robocalls and you know, this, that, and the other thing. Uh, so it's designed to, to go back and, and make sure, not just make all these, find, find uh, exposed personal information about you that you don't want uh, out there uh, and remove it, but it's also designed to continue to check back to see whether it's still removed. And if it isn't, automatically opts you out again. So it requires kind of a relentless and methodical uh, approach throughout the year, which is what we provide. Then I guess going back to our original discussion about semantics, what um, does Delete Me specifically focus in on people searching websites? Or does it also do things like Google search cleanup? white pages. So what is the scope of the tool? So great question. It is expanding. And so it is hard to pin down uh, an exact definition of what is our scope, but I'll tell you, I'll give you a couple examples. We are constantly adding new data brokers and people search sites to the service uh, every month, every year, and because they're changing and we're also finding new ones. And we include that in uh, our subscribers uh, service uh, at no additional charge. So think about it like, uh, I don't know, an Amazon Prime or a Netflix where you're getting new stuff uh, in, in, in your subscription. And that's what we want it to feel like and that's what we think is needed. In addition to that, we're trying to go beyond 
this narrow definition of, hey, people search sites are, are this and data brokers are that. And we're trying to expand the service to cover more and more uh, types of things. So an example would be Google Street View, view for your house. Uh, sometimes your apartment or your house is not just listed, but also there's a you know Im image on Google that somebody can go, oh, well, what is exactly, do they have a wall or bushes outside of their house? I mean, you know, there's all kinds of uh, sort of scary uh, uh, reasons that somebody would like to visually snoop on your surroundings. So we can include those kinds of things as we broaden the Delete Me service out to address more and more areas of, of privacy. And our vision uh, ultimately is to be the service that is continuously monitoring uh, anywhere and everywhere that you have concerns about your information being uh, exposed or misused and helping you with that as a service. That's, that's the company that we're trying to build. Really good stuff. And then you mentioned earlier, I don't think, because when we did our review of Delete Me a couple years ago, I think when I spoke to you, you said it was US only two years ago. So is it within the last two years that you've now expanded into the international division? Yes. What's that look like? It's a good example. We are making progress, expanding the service, not just in the U.S., but internationally, and expanding the types of privacy uh, monitoring and removals that we can provide to all of our customers. And that's really core to what we're doing every day and why we go to work. We are 100% uh, funded by, and always will be, our customer subscriptions and by their desires to control their information. Uh, and, 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 and so it's important that we continue to innovate, we broaden the service, we make it as effective as possible, and fight back against all this data that's being collected about all of us in, in, you know, everywhere that seems like a problem that's too big for us to solve. It is nice um, to have people like yourself who are trying to address that because, um, like, look, cost opportunity is a very real thing. Um, for those listening, that is your ability to decide what to do what in your life. You can't, you don't have unlimited time. So we have cost opportunity day to day. You make decisions and where you put your time and energy. And if you're just, like Rob said earlier, if you're just trying to get your kids to school, make your coffee, you don't want to have to worry about this nonsense. Um, and so for myself, same thing. I don't want to spend, you know, two hours a day just manually searching through people searching websites to make sure there's no updates. And then if there is an update, I have to go through the annoying process of going through all of that. And so um, I have been using Delete Me the last two years, and it is cool to see, you know, if anything gets picked up. Um, I will say I like to think I'm on the better end of things because it's very rare for me to get something that's like we recognize this. Um, I think over the last couple of years, there's been like a few data points that were picked up. And luckily, it wasn't correlated with much other data. It was like, oh, this phone number was found in this thing with your name. And then I looked and there was like nothing else tied to it, which was cool. But um, things still slip through the cracks, even when I like to think I'm doing a really good job with this. So. That's something that I really like about the service. Now, when it comes to, I guess, broader, I know we talked about this a couple of years ago as well, but when it comes to, I guess, more societal actions toward this, towards this, because um, in my eyes, and I don't mean this against your service, your service shouldn't need to exist in a, in a good world, you know, like um, this should just not be a problem in the first place. And it's kind of sad that people feel the need to have to sign up for something that takes care of this for them because it should, just shouldn't be a problem. And so what do you see as possibly a long-term solution here to help solve this problem so that people have more ownership over their data and privacy? And is that the same answer globally as well? I agree that many of these data removal, people search data removal companies uh, like, like us shouldn't need to exist because uh, we should have better options uh, provided on the uh, data broker or people search companies dime to permanently remove yourself. I think that that should exist. We need tougher laws 
around privacy regulation. We're getting more of them. There are more laws uh, passed uh, in more states in this country than uh, when we last talked two years ago. And I expect if we talk one or two years in the future, <laughs> there will be there will be more or there'll be a federal law. So laws are an important uh, part of leveling the playing field here and, and trying to make uh, make things fair for people that want to control their privacy and their personal information, but it's not ever going to be, it is unlikely to ever be enough uh, because there are legitimate use use cases for having this data out there. And uh, these companies are well-funded and they have lobbyists, you know, our system is what it is. So uh, I wouldn't expect radical change. So we need both laws and I think, uh, people taking action and uh, companies like ours taking action as well. And uh, just to, and, and I think that is true internationally. There's international, uh, there's a new law passed in Brazil. There was even a uh, law passed in China about personal information protection uh, for God's sake, because uh, the Chinese surveil everything. It's not a myth, uh, but uh, citizens all over the world are getting more rights to their data so they can take action, but they may not, have the time to your uh, to your comments about opportunity costs. They may not have the time to uh, to all take action, uh, even if they get uh, rights. And so, uh, services uh, like ours and others that help people take action, I think, are 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 important. And where we're trying to go, as I mentioned, is to broaden the service beyond these people search sites to give people. Uh, more oversight of of their personal information and their data wherever it's custody, where whatever database it's on, and uh, that that's a service uh, that that we think needs to exist, whether or not the people search companies uh, go away or uh, or stay. And I guess a, a question that came up as you were talking. So I, I'm I'm a California resident. California has some privacy regulation. Is that handled differently internally? Is there how how does that look like inside for you if you have a California resident instead of an Arizona resident? I don't think Arizona has any privacy regulation. They they don't, um, but but Utah and Connecticut and uh, Virginia and others do. Uh, so we do handle uh, specific cases differently based on the laws that you have as a resident of a particular state, and it's very helpful. Uh, for us, if you live in California, for Delete Me, because we use that fact in the uh, CPRA and CCPA, which are the acronyms for uh, the privacy laws that have been passed in California. We use those rights that California residents have to make sure that our requests are being handled in the most effect efficacious way by data brokers and people search sites. Got it. Yeah, even personally, there have been a few accounts that I had that I was trying to shut down. And I reached out to support and I said, hey, like, I want these accounts shut down. Um, and I get, you know, a generic response of, well, we don't really shut down accounts. We don't really do that. And then if I come back and I say, hey, I'm a California resident and I'm looking to um, enact my rights under the CCPA, et cetera, then normally they find a way to do it. Um, so I have found personally that there were definitely differences in how they handle either account deletion requests or things like that, even on my end when I reach out as a California resident instead of just a normal person, which always kind of boggles my mind a little bit because if I managed a company, um, I'd wanna keep things uniform for all my, my users. It's just easier that way from a strictly logistical perspective running a company, I assume, but I also assume that they don't want people deleting their accounts and they wanna hold on to that data at all costs. So I'm sure that there's kind of a balance that you're trying to strike there is my guess, but I don't know if you have insight to that problem or if it's just me sharing a story. I think there's a necessity uh, to use all the tools that we all can uh, as they evolve and as the situation changes and as laws change, because laws do change and you know, landscapes change and the data that's out there about us changes. And, and, and unfortunately, it is not a uh, one size fits all problem. And it shouldn't be treated as such. And the company that we're trying to build doesn't treat uh, everyone the same. We treat everyone uh, as differently as possible because their needs are different. The laws that uh, 
that are applicable to them are different and they may be different next year from this year. For yourself, uh, just out of curiosity, um, what made you want to start Delete Me? Um, because I, some people I've talked to, and there's no shame in this either, you know, like they saw the gap in the privacy industry and they moved into that industry. And then they kind of started realizing the importance of privacy once they moved there. Some people already loved privacy and they were in that. There's no wrong answer here. I'm just curious what your um, experience was entering the privacy world. There was no specific incident where... Um photos of myself were as a drag uh, uh, at a drag show were revealed, unlike some senators, uh, not, nothing against, uh, you know, uh, participating in drag. but uh, no, there wasn't an incident that drove me uh, to, to co-found the company, uh, much smarter uh, IT engineer, I would point out. Uh, but rather, you know, as an entrepreneur, there's certain things you believe in and personally, and there's certain things that you think can make money. And it's rare that those two converge. And when they do, it's always an, a great opportunity because you know you'll have the passion to pursue it and you think it can be lucrative ultimately. And uh, privacy was one of those things. I, I felt like, you know, entrepreneurs like freedom were basically not hireable. Um, I don't like uh, to be a cog in the wheel of some big company. And so freedom and privacy are very uh, linked together. Uh, it's hard to have freedom if you don't have the right to privacy. And at the time, this is around 2010, everybody was excited about uh, social sharing and Facebook and everything else. And all that data was going into the cloud and, uh, you know, the visionary uh, technical guys that I started the company with sort of saw the future uh, of how all this data wouldn't be all positive and used for, you know, bringing us together, but it would be used in, in, in ways that uh, violated our privacy and, and, and were very negative. And uh, that, that turned out to be the case. And, you know, when you're starting a business, you want to try to solve the biggest problem that you can and you want to believe that the problem will exist uh if not be bigger uh year after year for the next you know five or ten years that you have the opportunity to start the business so that's a little bit of the thinking that uh went into uh the the creation of the business which is now more than a decade old i didn't know it was that old i figured that you all just started it as this became a more widespread problem. So I didn't know that you started way back in 2013? 2010. 20, wow, 20, so well over a decade then. Um, that was even before the Snowden revelations. I don't, can't. But sp- it was. I can't speak to many people who have privacy products that were around before the Snowden revelations because that was actually the big wake-up call that I think really springed the current privacy world as we know it into action. So that's really cool stuff. Yeah, we're one of the original... Uh, the original gangsters of privacy. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Rob, it was a pleasure to have you on today. I I really think that a lot of people listening probably learned a lot about um, this whole industry, um, the one that you were in, but also the one that you're trying to tackle, um, and also probably learned a lot about themselves and the information that they're sharing to the world and how it's different from phone books back in the day. Um, and so I really appreciate all the advice that you share with our audience. And it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Now, let me just start by saying that this interview was a blast. I tend to learn a lot in every interview, but this one definitely exposed many gaps of knowledge that I had. And I really hope that you who listened got something from it as well. I wanted to outline that all of these interviews done on TechLore are done on our own accord, never sponsored. So if you enjoyed this interview, please consider supporting us here at TechLore, where our goal is to spread privacy and security to the masses. And your contribution goes a long way to make that a reality so we can keep growing and getting this content out to more and more people. We're on Patreon, LibraPay, and we even accept Monero contributions directly if you want to support our work 
and keep us going for years to come. I did want to also plug that we do have a Abine Delete Me affiliate link. So if you ended up liking the service and you find that it's useful for yourself, definitely check out the link down in the description so we get a kickback if you decide to purchase it. And just for transparency's sake, there is a standard link as well, so you have the choice of which link to use. You have no obligation to support us if you don't want to and you don't want to use the affiliate link. It's just a way for you to support our work if you're going to go through Abine and get their service anyway. Thanks again for listening, everyone, and I'll see you next time on TechLore.